will be reiterating what's in that paper, but I'll expanding it. I'm expanding it a bit more with, uh, well, with some insights from QCA because what's behind QCA is configurational thinking. QCA does not think in variables and net effects of individual variables, but it, it, it's a more conjunctional approach, a configurational approach. It's multiple factors that, when they are present, make an outcome possible, and that's a way of thinking about complexity. And I think that's sort of the underlying message I've got with my presentation this afternoon to help you appreciate the complexity of, uh, of, of reality, social reality, and also the complexity of, of causality. <coughs> so defining knowledge creation, um, when you talk about knowledge creation, I think it's always helpful to have a good definition of what you're talking about. To me, knowledge creation is an interaction between individuals in a social context. Um, ultimately, individuals are the key agents of knowledge creation. Uh, knowledge creation is connected to innovation, it's connected to lots of things, but it's ultimately people like you and me who are engaged in knowledge creation. Uh, it happens in social contexts, uh, and these can be very formal, very organized social contexts, such as project teams and organizations, and they can be much more informal, such as uh, professional networks, communities of practice, and that's really where my interest is. There's a wonderful book by Lester and Peel, came out in 2004. It's called uh, Innovation, the Missing Dimension, and they make a distinction between uh, the interpretive and the analytical phase of innovation. The analytical phase of innovation is really the innovation projects that you have in firms, in organizations, and project teams. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, that's sort of formalized, that's closed, because you don't really want your competitors looking in. I'm really more looking at the interpretive phase of knowledge creation, the interpretive phase of innovation. It, it sort of precedes or goes parallel to the analytical phase. It's where you start discovering things, making sense of things, trying out things, doing new things. It's much more open, much more loosely organized, and that happens in the social spaces that I'm, that I'm talking about, that I'm interested in. You will also notice that I do not talk about knowledge as in tacit and codified. I don't think, personally, that's a very helpful distinction. Uh, because I think knowledge is connected to social spaces. Uh, and for people who are in or close to that social space, the knowledge is accessible. And when you're outside of that social space, it becomes much more difficult. Social spaces, the way I talk about them, professional networks, communities of practice mostly, uh, they transcend organizational boundaries, they're not specific to any one organization or firm, um, and they're not necessarily territorialized. They may connect to one or more physical places, uh, but there's nothing intrinsic in social spaces that makes them connect to any particular place. And they are connected to places because of the individuals that occupy them, um, the, the individuals that populate these spaces. I mean, individuals like you and me, we are territorial. We, we live, we work in certain places, we are in certain places, and that's what makes these social spaces connect to particular places. We here, as a group, are a social space. Um, we talk about the relationship between uh, economic geography and, 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 and places and spaces. Uh, that's the topic of our social uh, context, of our community. Uh, and we connect to this specific place here, and that's, it's for a reason that we connect to this place here. Uh, and uh, we're staying, most of us, in, in the uh, Intercity Hotel at the Osbahnhof. If there were another uh, group of people, another conference that also stays in that hotel, and we would meet, uh, talk to these people over breakfast, then you have the physical place where two different social spaces connect and you exchange knowledge. Uh, and in another way, I mean, we all belong to different social spaces. We have our own organizations, our own networks, and this is already a physical place where all these social spaces at the moment connect and some knowledge creation is going on. So that's sort of how I think about places and social spaces. I started thinking about places and social spaces because I was completely unhappy with how the geography of knowledge creation is conceptualized in economic geography as a field. There are basically two equally completely inadequate models of looking at that. First of all is the proximity approach, the version inaugurated by Ron Bosma in his 2005 paper. 
Um, and many people know that paper, many people like that paper, uh, but I think it's actually a very bad paper in the sense that it reduces economic, uh, uh, geography to so sort of a formless abstract place uh, where, the, uh, where there is no, yeah, there's nothing that, that stands out there. And Ron Bosman would have been the first to uh, accept, to acknowledge that this is a paper that he wrote on the fly, basically. The story is that he, he was working on a special issue and there's one paper short for a special issue and he wrote this in one afternoon. The way it appeals to people is because um, it's a very simple and straightforward idea and it is written in the kind of variable language that dominates the social sciences. Uh, as in uh, proximities as independent variables doing something to an outcome, uh, knowledge creation. Throughout my talk I'll explain why I like to use a different language. Um, but yeah, the, the main problem with the proximities approach is that it, 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 there's no space, there's no geography in there. Space is a formless, abstract kind of landscape. The other way of thinking about it, and I'm guilty of contributing to that myself, as uh, Oliver said about my work on the learning region, which is one of the territorial innovation models. Um, and the problem of that is that it, it reduces uh, social spaces to territorial artifacts. We talk about regional social capital, we talk about regional institution, we talk about lots of things that are actually characteristics of social spaces as if they were regional things. And I think they're not. It's important to realize that they're not. The reason why territorial innovation models have been very attractive in the 1990s in particular, and, and still uh, particularly in, in, the, in the practice, policy practice today, is specifically because they talk about concrete spaces, bounded territory, uh, and yeah, of course, uh, particularly policymakers work in the context of bounded territory, and they want to improve the innovativeness of their places. But Many qualities, social qualities, are characteristics of social spaces, not of physical places. So my approach is to look at agents and their relationships. Uh, I look at social dynamics, and that's the connection that I think between social spaces and physical places. And in that sense, I connect to relational economic geography. Economic geography, you could say there are three main streams, main paradigmas, institutional, evolutionary, and, region, and, and relational economic geography. I belong more or less to the relational economic geography. Social dynamics, what are they? Uh, if they're important, then uh, yeah, you might want to define what they, what they are quite loosely. Uh, it's those things about social spaces that makes them work, you know, like the norms, the values, the social capitals, untraded interdependencies. There's lots and lots of things that characterize social spaces. And uh, social dynamics shape and are being shaped by social dynamics. Uh, pretty much everything uh, in the social realm, be it uh, uh, social structures, uh, social dynamics, institutions, that sort of thing, that sort of this symbiotic relationship. Agency is only possible through norms, values, social capital, and that sort of thing. But at the same time, these things only exist because of agency. We enact them, and that's why they exist. Um, at Malecki, called social, well, he talked about social capital, but it's one social dynamic. He called them the glue and the lubricant of social interaction. Uh, in a paper in, two, in 2012, in regional studies, uh, that's part of a special issue that I edited with uh, Franz Buchema, one of my long-term uh, partners, uh, a, sort of a special issue on learning regions, uh, and he came up with this idea of glue and lubricant uh, of, of social dynamics. And of course that's exactly what they are. They connect people together and at the same time they make interaction between them uh, uh, more easy. So social dynamics are sort of a framework for interpretation and that's also why it's difficult to get knowledge from one social space to another because it's really about socialization. Knowledge is about meaning and yeah, these social dynamics are about interpreting and giving meaning to knowledge. So from that perspective, both the proximity approach and the territorial innovation models approach are wrong, because social dynamics, rather than proximities, explain knowledge creation. And I would argue proximities, 
uh, relational, institutional, organizational, etc. proximity, they're much more an outcome of social dynamics than an input for knowledge creation. And the territorial innovation models, I believe they are wrong because they reduce social dynamics to a territorial artifact, but they are not. They belong to social spaces. Um, and in that sense, I've distinguished between the micro social dynamics and macro social dynamics. Micro social dynamics are really sort of the, the norms, the values of, of particular social spaces, networks and communities. And macro social dynamics are more of the, let's say, the culture, the institutions that shape regions, um, regional societies, uh, and a sort of they work on a slightly different level. Um, so knowledge creation, as I look at it, is really about the interaction between individuals, which is driven by these social dynamics, and knowledge creation results from this interaction. And then you can have, let's say, high and low social dynamics. Um, I borrowed actually this high and low bit from Bosma. Uh, I mean, it's not all that what he wrote. Uh, high levels and low levels of proximity talks about in the 2005 paper. And you could argue, let's say, high levels of social dynamics in which you have lots and lots of overlapping norms and values. And of course, that encourages interaction. It makes it easy to, to talk to people. But yeah, when you've got very high levels of overlapping these uh, overlapping social dynamics, overlapping norms and values, high level of social dynamics, you're not going to learn very much new things, so it's detrimental for knowledge creation. And the reverse is of course true for low social dynamics, if you have very divergent norms, values, uh, interpretations, it sort of discourages social interaction because those people are different, it's diff difficult to talk to them. But a little bit of divergence is actually very helpful because people know different things, have different ways of looking, and that makes it exciting and makes you create knowledge. But again, too much divergence is detrimental. And from this, you can sort of ideal typically categorize kinds of, of spaces. Um, you've got social spaces. Uh, Micro-social dynamics, so the norms, values of particular networks and communities can be very strong, which means people have very strongly overlapping norms and values. Um, Macro-social dynamics can be very strong, which means societies in a region are very strongly shaped and influenced by uh, regional cultures, norms, values, institutions. In that sense, you have what's on the upper right cell, you have long, uh, strong local ties. Um, <clears throat> Then on the opposite, uh, you have bus, which is yeah, people sort of serendipitously meeting in, uh, in, in, in places, whether they're local uh, or not local, virtual. Uh, so these are two ideal types, and local bus, non-local strong ties sort of uh, fit also in that picture. So, um, yeah, already here you see some kind of, some kind of connection between social dynamics and, 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 and places. Uh, and let's say the social context that I'm talking about, the, the norm of the, the above, but the sort of overlap a little bit. Social spaces, communities of practice, professional networks, they're partially about local strong ties, uh, but some of the other bits uh, can be involved there as well. So it's not any one of those four ideal types, but it's sort of in the middle. Um, Oliver talked a little bit about this uh, in, in, in his introduction. Um, when you talk about the relationship between, when you talk about the geography of knowledge creation, it's important to talk about what do you mean with geography. I've been clear about what I mean with knowledge creation and social dynamics. I think it's also important to uh, tease out what you mean by geography. Uh, and does space matter is a different question than does place matter is a different question than does geography matter. Uh, and does uh, space, place, geography matter for knowledge creation are also different questions with different answers. Um, again, I see knowledge creation as social interaction between individuals and social spaces. And these social spaces, they connect to specific places or physical places. The way I talk about it are specific venues that individuals happen to occupy. Uh, and they may or may not be connected by spatially stretched uh, conversations. Uh, conversations, I'll talk about that in a moment, because I think that's what's going on in these social spaces. We are at the moment having a conversation about, well, geography and knowledge creation, about space and place. 
Another important thing that I want to point out is that if you talk about space and place in this way, uh, and if you take um, the role of human agency in that seriously, that, there's absolutely no reason why you would want to expect that there's some kind of constant association between a cause and an outcome, in this case between something that is related to physical uh, place and social space on the one hand, and knowledge creation as an outcome on the other hand. Social reality is far more complex, it's far more dynamic. Uh, there's equifinality in, uh, in, in, in social reality, which means that different causes can have the same outcome. And under certain circumstances, the same causes can also have different outcomes. Uh, that's very difficult, if not impossible, to capture with variable language. There are other methods, such as QCA, that gives you some insight into doing that. Um, another thing which connects to my uh, work on QCA, which is basically what QCA uh, in tells you to do, or, or informs you to do, is uh, thinking about causality not as a forcing but as an enabler. I mean, the mainstream social science is about this idea that you have independent variables and dependent variables, and causality is something about something uh, an independent variable doing something to a dependent variable. Uh, one of the big problems with that is if you disassemble everything into variables, you've got no agents anymore. Uh, and you simply expect that real agents follow the correlational script that you wrote for them in your regression analysis most of the time. Uh, but agents tend not to do that all the time. As I said earlier on, causality is in reality is complex. Uh, we do sometimes we do things specifically to defy some kind of regularity. Um, you could see a, uh, causality not so much as a forcing but as an enabler. Conditions present make it possible for agents to achieve an outcome. It makes and it creates the willingness and the ability of agents to do something. Whether they actually do that, um, well, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, and these material conditions may to some degree be determined, but agency, of course, is not. Uh, and if you will, the, the, the ability to achieve an outcome, that's the material causes that may or may not be present, but whether an agent actually achieves the outcome, yeah, that, that's dependent on, on his or her willingness. And yeah, I mean, um, you can have uh, an example I always use in, in, uh, when I talk about QCA. I mean, uh, yes, if you have a fire in your house, that's a sufficient condition for calling the fire brigade. It makes it possible for you to call the fire brigade. But what if I just killed somebody and set fire to the house to conceal the crime? I'm not going to feel call the fire brigade. But that breaches the regularity between fire calling the fire brigade, uh, but it doesn't deny the, defy the underlying causal mechanism. So causality, if you look at it as an enabler, is contextualized. It's, it's something else than thinking it as a forcing. Uh, you want to take agents seriously. So yeah, when I'm talking about this, um, it, it's, for those who know that, it's really also inspired by critical realist philosophy of science. QCA as a method was never written with critical realism in mind, but it's actually very much a critical realist method. Uh, and uh, the work of Roy Baska or Andrew Collier is a good place to familiarize yourself with that if you're interested. <clears throat> Back to the topic of my talk, to uh, knowledge creation and, and, and the geography of knowledge creation. I said earlier on, uh, it's about knowledge creation happens in social spaces, and what happens in social spaces, the knowledge creation there, I call it conversations. That's the term I borrowed from the book of Lester and Dior about, manage, about innovation, the missing dimension. Conversations, uh, yeah, there are people in a social space, they create knowledge. It's not, in that sense, targeted at problem solving as the way it is an analytical uh, part of the innovation process. But it's certainly centered around a question, a problem, a topic that we're interested in. We're interested in the geography of knowledge creation, the spaces and places. Uh, because there's lots of things that we don't know about it. That's what this conversation is about. These conversations are informal and bottom-up. They're not really organized. We don't have a managing director that guides this conversation. It really emerges bottom-up. Conversations can be local, non-local, virtual, or all of the above. And uh, that's not a priori clear, depends on the conversation. It's ambiguous, it's about interpretation, it's about sense-making, and it proceeds 
innovation or runs parallel to innovation. Uh, what happens in conversations is what firms use as input in their innovation projects. Firms tap into conversations and the most successful innovating firms tap into lots of conversations to get rich ideas. To give you some examples of conversations, well, like the electric car conversation. That conversation builds on research on electric propulsion and batteries and the people who are engaged in that uh, conversation mostly are engineers, technicians, designers, marketeers, because the knowledge that they've got eventually decides whether the electric car actually does what it's supposed to do, drive, and whether it's appealing to people who want to buy it, to consumers. You need those kind of knowledge, those kind of experts involved in it. What's discussed in the electric car conversation is about uh, well, the performance, first of all, but also, of course, the appeal and the image of electric cars. Different models appeal to different kinds of consumers. And what comes out of these con this conversation, of course, is used by car manufacturers to make electric cars. And this conversation happens mostly at universities, at research centers, at car plants, because it is partially dependent on specific research facilities that allow you to do research on batteries on electric propulsion. So it's connected to those physical places where they've got those research facilities. That's different from, for example, the privacy and social media conversation. It's a much more recent conversation. Five, six years ago, we were not really occupied with that, but it's become big over the last few years. And the people engaged in that conversation are mostly software developers <coughs> and legal experts, because there's a legal connotation to it, not only about the technology behind it. Uh, and what these people discuss is mostly the, the functionalities, the user friendliness of social media. What we like about social media is that it's easy to use, it's user friendly, that it then leaks away all the data that you want to protect. Uh, that's a problem that we're not immediately aware of when we <coughs> use it. <coughs> but that's the kind of things that happens in this particular conversation. And what comes out of it is input for social media companies to improve the performance of their platforms. This conversation happens in different kinds of places. It happens, for example, in conferences, task forces, office meetings. But it doesn't require you to have any real specific physical hardware. If you have a laptop uh, that's connected to the internet, <coughs> you can have this discussion anywhere in the world. You do, you're not dependent on particular research facilities. So the kind of conversation you've got already has an implication for the geography of your conversation. And I think that's an important thing that much of the economic geography literature overlooks when they talk about knowledge creation and innovation. They talk about it as if it's sort of a blanket thing. It's not. It's about specific things, and specific things have a different geography. Okay, so I've talked about social spaces. I've talked about knowledge creation. Let's move a bit to the geography of conversations. Um, that's about the geographical dynamics. And I've distinguished two kinds of geographical dynamics, distance and place dynamics. Let's first look at the distance dynamics. Distance is about, distance dynamics is about how likely are you to bridge distance? What makes you connect to people somewhere else? And of course it has to do with the effort to bridge uh, to somewhere else. Uh, there is, uh, well, going to this place, Urgna, is relatively easy. Uh, maybe not all of us would have been here if we'd had this somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's apparently beautiful countryside outside of Berlin, between here and the Elder River, but it's much more difficult to, to get there, so that would have probably already made it more difficult. So effort to bridge distance affects distance dynamics. Preference to connect to certain individuals uh, is an, 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 an incentive to actually go there. Um, you know, uh, if you go back to um, uh, the story of Lancelot in Merlin, you know, he, Lancelot needed to go to Merlin because Merlin had specific knowledge that he had and therefore Lancelot had to travel for many weeks across mountains and forests to get to that gentleman. Uh, if you need to connect to that particular individual, I'm actually talking about dependence, uh, but it's all of the same thing, uh, yeah, you're more likely to bridge the distance than when you're not dependent or you don't particularly want to, that, to talk to those individuals. All of us have a preference of being here, so we, that's why we're here. So these are the distance dynamics that tell you something about the likelihood of 
why you would want to bridge the distance. It's about being there. Uh, because there is the place where the other is, where you want to talk to, and, and, and how important is it to be there. That's distance dynamics. And then there's place dynamics. How attractive uh, is a place for you to be? How attractive is a place for knowledge creation? And that's basically about connectivity and diversity. Connectivity can be digital, local, and global. Uh, it simply means that it's easy to get to that place, whether in real or virtual, and that from that place you can connect to many other places. Um, and uh, that is also one of the key reasons why knowledge creation, innovation, particularly in the 21st century, happens in global hubs, in major urban areas, because they, they're connected geographically and digitally. Um, the benefit of being a connected place is that it's not only possible for people from all over the world to come to your place, but people who work, live in that place are also, it's easy for them to connect to the rest of the world. So that already makes a place that is connected a hub of global and local knowledge. It's easy to, because lots of social spaces will connect permanently, temporarily, directly, indirectly to that particular place, and that makes it an exciting place for innovation. Uh, when many, many social contexts connect to a place, it's much easier to have crossovers between those social spaces. Uh, and that, that contributes, of course, to innovation and knowledge creation. It's also about diversity, about technological, social and cultural diversity. It's about who is there and what's going on. This is, well, it, it, it borrows from the literature from Richard Florida uh, about his create work on the creative class uh, and his work on tolerance. The work of Florida has been criticized, even ridiculed in much of the economic geography literature, mostly because the empirics behind his work are shaky, which of course is true. He has indexes that he correlates, and well, that's a bit dodgy. But I think the underlying logic uh, is much more compelling. And the paper I published in Journal of Economic Geography on openness, values, and regional innovation actually sort of substantiates some of his ideas, because what I find using QCA is that um, there are different paths, really, that explain why some regions are innovative, uh, uh, and, and several of these paths specifically include openness values, such as tolerance and, 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 and a social cultural diversity. So yes, there is something that makes these places attractive for people to be uh, in, in the way sort of the Richard Florian <coughs> talked about that. So place dynamics is about being where. Some places are simply more attractive for knowledge creation than others. So how then can you, again, look at how this, this works out? You have the distance dynamics and the place dynamics. They can be weak, they can be strong, both of them. If you have strong distance and strong place dynamics, you have multiple you have a conversation that is anchored in multiple places. Uh, I'll give you some examples later on. Uh, and you can have these different kind of uh, ideal typical conversations uh, <coughs> um, and that you have there. If, let's say, the, um, uh, the distance dynamics are strong, uh, it means that a particular conversation connects to multiple places. Um, I'll give you an example in a moment. <coughs> or whether specific to a single location. Uh, you know, the ideal typical one sort of is if you want to develop knowledge about building a wide body airliner, there's basically only two firms in the world that do that, Airbus and Boeing, so you need to go to Toulouse or to Seattle. That conversation is pretty much connected to one or a very few places. Whereas the um, uh, social media, uh, privacy and social media, uh, it, it's, it's connected to much more places. So you get different kinds of geographies already, if you will, um, um, depending on the distance and the place dynamics that you talk about. So again there, you see the complexity. It's not about geography having an effect on knowledge creation, or place or space having an effect on knowledge creation. It's really about what kind of knowledge creation are you talking about, what, what kind of knowledge are you creating, and that has an effect that is affected by, uh, by geography. To give you some examples, this is the active car conversation. 
Uh, it's multi-local because obviously there are lots and lots of car manufacturers throughout the world that are all working on this conversation uh, and they all have their research facilities uh, where they talk about uh, this electric car conversation. So this conversation happens in multiple, multiple places at the same time. Uh, so that means it has uh, strong place dynamics, it has also strong distance dynamic because this conversation is of interest to lots and lots of people who want to connect to those places to, to participate in that conversation. The privacy of social media conversation, yes it happens in multiple places uh, and people uh, uh, bridge distance to go to those conversations but as I said earlier, it's not dependent on any specific kind of facilities in any of those locations. There's no research facilities, there's no laboratories, there's no campuses that are necessary to be for that particular conversation. Um, this one, a nice one, a local one, it's, it's weak on distance and weak on, on, on place dynamics, the rebuilding of the Potsdamer Platz in the 1990s here in Berlin. Potsdamer Platz was well, pretty much the center of Berlin before the war. It was in no man's land during the Cold War. Uh, and after reunification of Germany, there was this empty space that had to be rebuilt. Well, what do we do with it? That was a very important conversation, but pretty much only to the Berliners. Uh, people in Potsdam probably could care less. So the, the inclination for outsiders to connect to that conversation was pretty much zero. Uh, and the relevance of that discussion for somebody else somewhere else was also not particularly important. Of course, experts were flown in on architecture and urban landscapes from all over the world, but it was, it was about that particular place and only by that particular place, and it was interesting pretty much only for people who were involved in it. And then you have, well, an, an example I just called here was uh, Boeing and Airbus. That's what you have this particular knowledge, this particular conversation about wide-bodied aircraft. But an example from my country about the Delta Works protecting the land from the sea. That's a fairly unique situation to the Netherlands where you have pretty much two-thirds of the country below sea level. And because of that, uh, lots and lots of engineering knowledge to protect our, us, ourselves from the sea. Uh, High-tech, uh, very advanced, very sophisticated but not particularly relevant to all the people in all the places. And if you're not really in, in, in uh, marine engineering, there's no reason why you should connect to that conversation. Well, sea level rise may do with miracles for us and move that conversation to somewhere else in that diagram, but you get the idea. Um, so that about the geography of, of conversations and geography of knowledge creation. So it really depends on what you're talking about what the, uh, the, the, um, the relationship between space and place is. At this point, I want to move on to, I still have some time for that, want to move on to sort of the next topic, introducing uh, causal complexity, QCA a little bit through the back door. This is the model that we all know. This is sort of the mainstream model uh, of, of causality in, 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 uh, in pretty much all of the social science. It's about individual independent variables doing something to dependent variables. And the language that we use is linear algebra. We formalize it to linear algebra. And linear algebra looks something like this. Regional knowledge creation is a function of the net effect of place dynamics plus the net effect of distance dynamic plus the net effect of social dynamic plus an error term. That's the language, the formal language that much of the social science uses. And it's about, in this case, place dynamics having an independent net effect on regional knowledge creation. And the more place dynamics you've got, the higher the likelihood of, of, of regional knowledge creation. When you look at my story uh, the last half hour, you will understand that this is not a very helpful model to explain what role place dynamics place play in, 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 in the geography of knowledge creation because it depends on all the other dynamics whether it is or is not helpful for regional knowledge creation. So another way of looking at it is not by looking at correlations between variables but by looking at regions that have membership in specific sets. You have the set of place dynamic regions, you have the set of distance dynamic regions, the set of social dynamic regions. I'm, collapsing a couple of things in now to make it, uh, to explain the message. And the language that QCA uses is not linear algebra, but Boolean algebra, and that allows you to make complex 
definitions. So whether you've got regional noise creation is not about any one of those three conditions themselves, but it's the combination of social dynamics and place dynamics, or the combination of place dynamics and distance dynamics, or the combination of social dynamics and distance dynamics. So you have three pathways in this set, uh, case that explain regional noise creation. And guess what? These mechanisms are qualitatively different. Different dynamics happen there. People do different things. Uh, in that paper in, in Journal of Economic Geography about openness and, and regional innovation, I have well, basically two, well, four, but let's say two different paths. Uh, one is, includes openness values and the other doesn't. One that doesn't include openness values is about technology. It's the technology configuration, as I call it. There are only technology terms here, which suggest that that is about really technological knowledge creation, about engineers talking to other engineers and technologists and, 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 uh, and these kind of people, which means you do not have to bridge communities. You stay within your own community of engineers, and then you don't need openness values such as tolerance to talk to other people. But the openness values configurations, they are about economic and social cultural diversity, which is about knowledge creation by crossing over between multiple social spaces, and then you need openness values to be able to talk to each other. So these different paths reflect different dynamics, different causal mechanisms, if you will. Um, so the role that place dynamics in this case place is well, it doesn't on and of its own explain regional knowledge creation, but only as part of a broader configuration with one or two other factors. That's the complexity that, how I like to think about um, <coughs> uh, causality. I'll skip these slides because that will take me too long to, to go through. Let's, let's just give you a bit more of uh, examples to, to clarify this. Thinking in terms of set relationships. So we've got the set of knowledge creating regions. That's what we want to explain. You're lovely, thank you very much. Um, that's the outcome set, that's what we want to explain. And we've got place dynamic regions, and we want to know whether place dynamics explains noise creation. And then we see the couple of cities, regions, that are good on place dynamics, such as London and Cologne, obviously, that are exciting places you want to be. So is Berlin, but Berlin is not famous for being a really noise creating place. That happens in other places. So this set of place dynamic regions is an inconsistent subset of knowledge creating regions, meaning this does not explain that in set analytical language. The same goes for distance dynamics. We've got a couple of, well, we've got uh, London and Cologne, Toulouse, that's a distance dynamic region because yeah, if you want to talk to Airbus about wide-body aircraft, of course, you, you need to go to, to Toulouse, so that's the distance dynamics. There's another place that's got high distance dynamic, Ibiza. There's lots of uh, reasons you might want to go there, but not for knowledge creation. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama is a knowledge creating region, but it's in the middle of Alabama. The only region you'd ever go there if you want to talk to NASA. They've got some research facilities there. And the reason is Werner von Braun, he was moved to America after the Second World War and they gave him an opportunity to, to develop a laboratory wherever he wanted it and Huntsville, Alabama for somehow reminded him of the forests of his own region. And that's why in the middle of nowhere they got this research facility in Huntsville, Alabama. There's no reason any sane person would ever want to go to the depths of Alabama. I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes who's from the American South. Wonderful visitor center, I've been there. But other than that, no reason why I should be there. But, so again, this is an inconsistent subset relationship. Uh, this does not explain that. But what if I make it a little bit more complex? When you have regions that are both distance dynamics and place dynamics, then basically we have London and Cologne, those two regions, and this is a consistent subset of the set of knowledge creating regions. Meaning that this conjunction of these two conditions is sufficient to explain knowledge creation. It's sufficient because it's not the only explanation. These two regions have a different kind of explanation. There's a different mechanism that explains why these regions are knowledge creating regions. 
But this specific, specific combination of these two conditions explains regional knowledge creation. This is the language that, well, the, the formal language here is Boolean algebra, and this is the way of thinking, the kind of thinking that QCA, qualitative comparative analysis, allows you, uh, forces you into. It's a very different way of thinking about causality than thinking of terms of independent and dependent variables. It's a kind of uh, thinking that um, requires you to look at your cases more holistically uh, rather than disassemble them in variables. Uh, and it, it uh, makes you uh, appreciate the complexity of reality and also of causality more specifically. Um, this gets a bit technical, so I'll, I'll not talk about that. Um, yeah, I'll talk about this. So, the differences between these two approaches, the variable based, which is sort of what mainstream social science does, and the case based method, which is what QCA is about. Um, variable based thinking, and this is very pervasive uh, in the social sciences because even many qualitative researchers think in terms of dependent and independent variables, and in, an independent variable must have some kind of effect on a dependent variable. And there's actually a, a broad range of methodological case study literature that implicitly or explicitly works from this basis, that it's about independent and dependent variables. This is an effects of causes approach, where you start by a known cause and you predict the outcome. This is about seeing causality as a forcing, as an independent variable doing something to a dependent variable. You look at correlation between variables. You can do that with statistics, of course, but there are also qualitative ways to do that. Uh, and this language, particularly the formal mathematical language, linear algebra, is additive. You add all the net effects of the individual, individual independent variables. It is unifinal. However long and complex your regression equation is, it's got one value, one outcome, so it's, it's unifinal. And it's symmetrical. Uh, because low values of x predict low values of y and high values of x predict high values of y. There's a linearity in that. You can complicate that by calculating interaction and u-shaped effects and that's all the things but the basic is, is linear. This is simple causality uh, and this is what is sort of the basic logic behind social science for the past 50-60 years. Case-based methods put you in a different framework. It's about causes of effects. It's not about prediction. It's about beginning to see, oh, a case has a particular outcome. This is a knowledge-creating region. Why is it a knowledge-creating region? Which causes might explain that this is a knowledge-creating region? So it's a, a causes of effects approach. You detect causes rather than predict effects, so you work in opposite directions. And even without getting into the method methodological niceties, Prediction or detection, as going in opposite directions, has phenomenal consequences for how you go about empirically. This is about set relationships between cases. You don't disassemble them into variables. And this is about complexity. It's about configurations uh, of conditions. Technically, we call them minus conditions. That's insufficient but necessary parts of an unnecessary but a sufficient conjunction. I'll explain that in a bit more detail in the QCA tutorial on Friday. You can forget about it. It's conjunctional. It's, it's two, two conditions that have to be there together for the outcome to occur. Uh, but other combinations of conditions can also explain the outcome. That's configurational. It uses Boolean algebra, which is actually ridiculously simple because it ultimately works only with ones and zeros and adding them and, and combining them. Linear algebra is far more difficult to learn. I don't know linear algebra really. I learned this in half, in half a day. It's very simple. And it's asymmetrical. Uh, because, go back to this one, uh, the presence of distance and place dynamics explains regional innovation, regional knowledge creation, but the absence distance and place dynamics are absent here, they do not explain the absence of knowledge creation because here they are absent, 
but it's still a knowledge creating region. So there's no symmetry between causes and outcome. Things that explain the presence of a cause may be very different than things that explain the outcome of a cause. Uh, the presence of an outcome may be very different than things that explain the absence of an outcome. So that's a very different way of thinking about uh, reality and about complexity. Um, skip this. Drawing the argument together. Um, so it's about the interaction of social space and physical place. That's what I was trying to talk about. And that fundamentally is a configurational argument because it's the combination, different combinations of distance, place and social dynamics that explain why some places are uh, knowledge creating places and others are not. And these different kinds of combinations of these factors are different reasons why different places are knowledge creating regions. Toulouse is a knowledge creating place for a very different region than Cologne. The region where I'm from, North Brabant, with the Eindhoven Philips uh, research facilities, is a, is a knowledge creating region, but for a very, very different region than Silicon Valley. Although Eindhoven also has some top in the world technological knowledge comparable to what they have on a smaller scale, but comparable to what they have in, in, in Silicon Valley. But completely different reasons why they are knowledge creating regions. So fundamentally, it's about a configurational argument. Um, so there's equifinal mechanisms at work here, and that's what the complexity thinking of QCA uh, talks about. Um, and different kinds of conversations, I've talked about the electric car conversation, uh, the uh, uh, privacy and social media conversation, the Potsdam Platz conversation, the different kinds of conversations, they will combine these place, distance and social dynamics in different ways and connect them to place and space in different ways. And ultimately, this is, you know, I believe, social science is about people doing stuff. It's not about variables. Uh, there may be reasons why you uh, do research in terms of variables, but I like to think you should always link it back to people doing stuff. Conversations are fundamentally about people doing stuff. There are people, individuals, and social spaces talking to each other about a specific topic, about a specific problem, uh, and we can conceptualize how to do it, why to do it, based on this language of, of causal complexity. Uh, the nice thing about QCA, as I said, it's, 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 it, it combines empirical rigor to some degree with this Boolean algebra, because you have to think about uh, the degree in which a, a case is a member of the set. Obviously, well, since we have a little bit of time left, let's, let's talk to this slide anyway. Uh, place dynamics. Yes, of course, uh, London has place dynamics. You want to be there, it's an exciting place. Frankfurt on the Oder, probably not. It's a bit further east from here. Um, not, not very exciting. Uh, the same goes for Cologne, and yet there's sort of a difference here between, yeah, okay, Lincoln, Kassel, and, and, and Leipzig, and Newcastle. I mean, yeah, I've been to Leipzig, Newcastle is where my, uh, my wife used to live for many, many years. They're not quite as exciting as places like Cologne and London, but they're exciting. You want to be there. It's fun places. Whereas Kassel and Middlesbrough have also visited those places. It's nice to be there in the afternoon and you think, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. I hope I don't step on anybody's toes, but okay. Um, so there's a difference in kind here. Uh, there are regions above and below the crossover point, and this goes for pretty much anything. Place dynamics, distance dynamics. Berlin is a city that I qualify not as a knowledge creating region. Of course there's knowledge creation going on in Berlin, and in many ways actually highly exciting and high tech knowledge, but not to the level that happens in places like Cologne and London and Toulouse. So it's about determining a qualitative cutoff between places that are and are not a member of the set. You can think of it in terms of ones and zeros, uh, being a member and not being a member. So case-based research as causes of effects is really about differences in kind, it's not really about differences in degree. Yes, uh, Lincoln is more exciting than Middlesbrough uh, and Kassel is more exciting than Frankfurt, but they're still unexciting places. Uh, and Leipzig is less exciting than London, but it's still an exciting place. So difference in degree are not particularly relevant. 
There is, of course, a way to, to do that QCA. You, you can have crisp set that works with one and zeros. You can also have fuzzy sets. Then this would be, well, close to one, close to zero, and this would be close to one. And then here you would have sort of the 0.5 regions that are sort of neither in nor out. And then let's say Leipzig would be 0.6, and then Lincoln would be 0.4, something in that case, as a member in the set. Uh, works slightly different, but the overarching logic is pretty much the same. Um, so that's a different way of thinking, not in terms of variables, but of membership of cases into a condition. Uh, and then we come to pretty much the closing of my presentation. Why should we care about this as economic geographers? As I told you, I work in an organization studies department, but I'm really actually an economic geographer. Um, why should we worry about configurational thinking? Well, I hope my discussion about uh, the connection between social space and physical place is convincing, but also because actually uh, economic geography is already a deeply configurational way of looking at the world. Institutional economic geography is about, for example, institutional thickness. It's not about individual institutions having an effect on whatever happens in the region, innovation. It's about all the institutions together that make that, that, innovate, that, that region as innovation. That's what institutional thickness means. It's about because you have this combination of institutions that makes you an institutionally thick region and that then explains why you've got innovation in your region. And the same really goes for evolutionary economic geography. It's because you have path-dependent development, this means there are lots and lots of different factors in a region that have to do with your economic, your economy, your history, whatever else. And it's about all these things together that propel you into a certain direction. It's not about these factors individually contributing to an outcome, because if you take any one of those factors out in evolutionary language, you change the path. So you could have even use an even evolutionary economic geography, you could sort of use QCA to tease out how you could plausibly change the path by taking out a particular factor and see what that does. Um, and relational economic geography, I've talked about, basically what I've talked about is relational economic geography about uh, social, physical, uh, social uh, place and distance dynamic combining in different ways to explain regional knowledge creation. And each of those particular combinations you know, reflects different causal paths of why that region is a, a, a regional, a knowledge creating region. So, our theories, in many ways, in economic geography, are already or can be framed as configurational. Uh, so, why not take the next step and also you start using configurational methods? Um, yeah, okay, so that's, that's my position as, as a sort of a closing statement. Uh, and since I take the advantage and liberty of being a keynote speaker, I can make a bit of a stronger statement. Uh, I think it's sort of absurd to think that geography or any other independent variable should have an independent effect on its own. It's always conjunctional, contextual. Um, and I think the seeing causal causality as something complex for me is, of course you may differ, that's why we are scientists and no scientist ever knows the truth the real truth, um, also I may be wrong, but I think seeing causality as complex uh, is really the only, for me, it's the only defensible position of thinking about causality. Uh, and then, of course, if you believe that, then why not take the next step and start using with configurational theories and methods. Um, that gives us a good half hour for questions. So thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Could you elaborate a bit more on your database? What makes you uh, change the region as more you set up?